What's up guys? I'm Jeff Neubauer from Chasing Pelagics and today we're going to be talking vertical jigging. Uh, we got a lot of questions from our last video and we wanted to, uh, to make a, a second video and try and go over a lot more of those topics. So um, first thing we're going to talk about is, uh, is jigs. Uh, whatever jig you're using, your personal preference, um, there's a couple rules of thumb that you really want to go by. And uh, the first and foremost, as far as the weight, you're going to be looking uh, at roughly a gram per foot. And what that's going to do is allow your, your jig, because we're vertical jigging here, to drop vertically. Uh, if you're using too light of a weight uh, or you have too much current, uh, your jig's going to start going sideways and it's not going to get the same, same action that you're looking for uh, when you're vertical jigging. Again, you want to have a nice steep drop and let the jig give the action and do the work. Um, now when it comes to your preference of shape, um, size, again, uh, a gram per foot is typically the, the, the recommendation. So a 300 gram jig for 300 feet deep of a uh, drop is what you're looking for. If you got a little bit more current, um, you can go to a little bit more thinner profile jig that's not gonna flutter as much as this one would. Um, or you could go to a lot smaller profile jig uh, with similar weight. So, those are different ways that you can kind of get your, your jig down to the specific area that you want to. As far as it, colors, it's always been a topic, um, a lot of hype around colors. Um, I don't know if you know or not, but Jig Pro Fishing makes these specific jigs right here. All of their prototypes that they test, they test them with no color. So when they go fish, make sure they, they catch fish with them and there's no color. And if they like the jig and the performance of the jig, then they'll start making it with color. So, uh, so something to think about. I know sometimes uh, some fish do react to, to color more than others, um, but as far as the specific type of color, I'd say 90% uh, of the actions that come from the jig action itself and not from the color. Uh, but one thing to consider is actually glow paint. So once you kind of cross the 250 to 300 foot level of depth, uh, the sun doesn't penetrate the water as well and the color you're not really going to see anyway. So it's total darkness past 300 feet. So the only thing that's going to be left to be seen uh, is anything left from glow paint. So make sure your jig has some type of glow paint on it, whether it's dots or stripes or, or even a, a line down the side. Um, you really want to make sure that you have some type of glow paint to it. And you can use a UV flashlight to illuminate it a little bit more if you're, if you're going to be doing it at nighttime. But uh, some type of glow will help get a little bit more, re more reaction to your jig itself. Um, now, as far as hooks, a lot of questions about hooks. How many hooks do I use? Do I, do I use uh, singles? Do I use doubles? Um, it's all really personal preference, but I, I'll give you a, a few recommendations that, that I think work well. Um, my favorite is just the two standard on the bottom. Um, it's really simple. It's where you want the fish to be hooked anyway, at the bottom of the, of the jig to keep the business out of the way. Now, when you get to a longer profile jig like this, if you only have two hooks on the bottom and the fish bites it here, maybe it lets go or a dog bones it, um, these hooks aren't going to end up in the mouth. So you're going to want to fish with, you know, three or more typically. Now, when it comes to IGFA rules, they will only recognize three hooks on a jig as being legal. The traditional slow pitch uh, Japanese technique is, is really four hooks, two, two on each end. So it's really a personal preference. Now, if you're gonna be fishing in the bottom um, with a jig, but not, let's say for slow pitch fishing, not specifically for tuna, um, a lot of guys like to hook them on the top. And that's because when the jig hit the bottom, it doesn't give away for the hooks to snag if they are placed on the bottom seen that before, but as far as per personal preference, if you're only going to fish uh, one hook or two hooks, make sure they're, they're at the bottom. And what it's going to do is, let's say the fish does dog bone it, right? All you're going to do is wind, and that's going to slide the jig up and these hooks are right into the fish's mouth. And that's what you're looking for every single time. Now, if you're whipping your rod up, you know, this jig's only going to travel the tip of your rod, maybe, depends on how, how much sack you pull out, uh, you're not going to get these hooks into the mouth of the fish. So once you hook up, you want to make sure that you wind it through and pull these hooks 
all the way into the mouth. Now, when it comes to assist hooks, I like to go with the traditional hook on the PE line. Um, these are the 901s that I sell, and they are with a 240 pound rated PE line, and then they're also covered uh, to reduce abrasion. Now, this is the typical setup that I like. This is how I fish, I'd say like 95% of my jigs. Um, I've seen people do a lot of rigging with like wire uh, or doing solid metal rings and welding them all and doing a swivel for every single hook. Um, I mean, it's, it's completely unnecessary. Um, first things first, uh, people think it's stronger. It might be for the day. I'm not sure how many people are washing their stuff down after every use with fresh water before they put it back in their tackle box. But um, I've checked a lot of swivels that I've used over the years and after uh, maybe a year or two, you can get enough salt water in them. Um, they get rusted, they don't swivel correctly and uh, eventually they break. So if I'm just fishing straight assist hooks, if, if I'm worried about these getting damaged or straightening this 380 pound rated split ring, I'm gonna see some type of sign of it first, right? Whether it be abrasion or the ring you know, being oval or coming undone, I'll have a sign. But if you're only fishing something that has a swivel and welded, welded rings, you're never gonna know when it's gonna fail until it's failed. So I like to stick with this. And then uh, again, I, I'm, I'm using a jig leader that has a swivel at the top. So I don't need a swivel on a swivel, it pretty much defeats the whole purpose here. So as long as I have one swivel, my jig can do whatever it wants to do and hang all day long. That's the whole idea behind it, so. So I like to be really organized when it comes to bringing jigs. Um, I've tried putting jigs in your typical Plano box and you'll find that they bounce around, the paint comes off, your assist hooks are all banged up all over the place, they're all connected to each other and when you're trying to switch out a jig, Last minute, uh, it's really frustrating to try and untangle that mess. So, uh, what I like to do is carry a jig bag from Jig Pro Fishing, and I've got all my jigs in slots with no hooks, the heavier, heavier ones here, etc. Um, you can fit a lot of jigs in this thing to where it gets uh, pretty pretty heavy. And then uh, I keep my my leaders in a bag and my hooks in the bag, separate, ready to go. And all of mine are fastened to split rings. Really simple, so I can take my, my jig right when I'm ready to go, take my split ring pliers, two hooks are on my jig, I can grab my jig leader, say I'm fishing at night, you can grab one of these, which is ball bearing swivel at the end, right? And then split ring on top. Take my split ring for all my jig leader. Throw it on my jig. Boom, I'm ready to go. Um, if I wanna switch out jigs, same thing, you know, I can leave this tied on to my rod already, so I'm not retying knots. And then just use my split ring pliers again and reconnect them to my jig and switch out to whatever I want. If you want to throw on another hook, throw on another hook at the top, same thing. And uh, just a really easy way to stay organized. And then when I'm done with my trip, I can do the same thing, disconnect everything, put it back in the bag. Everything stays neat and organized and I don't have jigs all connected to each other. It makes it really easy to, uh, to maintain. Now, when it comes to jigging at nighttime, I'm still using uh, a heavy duty jig leader. Um, this one, for example, is a two foot one. This is one that I sell. Um, this would be a time when, if I already have a, a, a top shot leader on my reel and I just want to tie onto a swivel so I have some abrasion protection, uh, for the top two feet, this is an example of why I would use a two foot one. Uh, I also make them in a six foot version and that's if you're gonna tie directly to a snap swivel uh, that's tied straight braid. So your leader essentially becomes the top shot uh, for a braid uh, abrasion. Now, 
I can sell those leaders to you. I also make and sell the California Crimp Kit. Crimp Kit has everything that you need to make these jig leaders. Uh, starts with swivels and split rings rated for 380 pounds. And then we include all the crimps you need for line sizes 150 pound all up to 400 pound, including chafe protection. We include the crimpers themselves. So if you need to make them uh, beforehand or if you're on the boat, they're included and fit inside the, the plan of tackle box. And then we also include the split ring pliers as well. So you can ch change out your jigs really easy as well. Um, just everything all in one place. And if you really want to, you can start throwing your jig leaders and your hooks inside the box all at once. And you have a full set to take with you on a trip and you'll have everything you need with the exception of the line itself, which is primarily your own preference from there on. Now during daytime, I'm still using fluorocarbon line, typically 80 to hundred pound. Uh, that's what I'm using all the time, unless for some reason we know that they're only small fish around, but for primarily, uh, I'm only using 80 to hundred pound fluorocarbon. Now, when it comes to rod and reel setup, uh, I'm still using a, this is a, a, pin, a pin Fathom 60, uh, lever drag, two speed, uh, 40 or the 60, I think is a really great reel for uh, nighttime jigging. Um, we're not casting these jigs, we're strictly just dropping them down and letting them go down to the bottom, or not to the bottom, but they're going down, okay? Um, we're not casting these, and these are really great reels. That, uh, for as big as they are, they're extremely light. And although there is more beefier reels out there, like if you want to get to an international, great reel, it can definitely handle what we're trying to do, but they're a lot heavier. So if you're gonna be working this jig all night or all day, uh, and especially if you're whipping it in the zone, uh, which is a technique we're gonna talk about, this is gonna wear you out, man. You start doing that for three or four hours, or if you're up all night after you've been fishing all day, staying at the rail, and you're holding a, a heavy reel, and you're trying to whip this thing all night, uh, you're gonna be gassed, I, I promise you. So stick to uh, what will work, but not wear you out. So that way you, you, you still have, have a chance here. Now, uh, when it comes to line, I'm still using white line. Uh, that's marked every 100 feet with uh, a black Sharpie. I'm doing one foot sections of black. So my first 100 feet is one foot of black line. It's really easy to see in the dark. Even if it's going out fast, I can still see it. 200 feet, I do two sections of one foot long, all black, and then 300 foot, same thing, and you do 400 foot, etc. Now, since we made our last video, there's been a couple manufacturers that have come out with multicolored line. You've seen multicolored line before, but typically it changes colors every 25 feet, which is, uh, that's gonna be really hard to count when you're going up and down uh, a whole bunch. So, but this line is now marked every 100 feet with a different color, which is much easier to use. So if you didn't want to use white line and mark it with a Sharpie, you can use this. This one's made by Power Pro. Uh, Iser line also makes it also. This is the Depth Hunter Offshore, different from the original Depth Hunter, which is only 25 feet. So every 100 feet, a little bit easier way to keep track of your line. Now, as far as technique, what I'm doing is I'm dropping my line, putting a free spool. I got one thumb on, on the reel itself and I hold, my, I hold my finger out just like this. And what this does is I'm only slowing the reel down enough so it doesn't backlash. Well, one, my finger's gonna help it not backlash. Two, this is all braid. There's no stretch whatsoever. So when that jig is dropping and it gets bumped on the way down, which usually the way it happens about 95% of the time, I can feel it in this finger. If anything hits that jig on the way down, I can feel it with my finger. And all I have to do is drop and lock it in gear and then wind. And that fast is how fast I'm gonna get hooked up. I'm not suing on the rod. I'm out looking it up super fast to try and set the hook. All you're gonna do is whine because half the time, what's happening is this, what I talked about with all those jigs. What's happening is that this jig is falling, okay? And as it's falling, sometimes the fish come up and they grab it. So that's why you get that sensation is, oh, it stopped it like, it, like it hit the bottom, but I didn't hit the bottom. It's because the fish grabbed it, right? So if you whip up, you're completely gonna miss this bite. You need to reel 
And what that's gonna do is pull these hooks into the fish's mouth. Now, the best part about this is that half the time, they don't even know they're hooked. So you get some fish that act really weird. They'll swim right up to the surface. You grind on them for maybe five minutes, just you know, with some tension. And then they come to the boat and they don't even know what's going on. All of a sudden, either they get gaffed in the head or they swim all the way back down and totally panic. Or you get one that's bit and is really pissed off, doesn't know what happened. And now you're in for a good fight, but you're already pretty far down. Now, what we're gonna try and do with this technique is what I, I like to refer to as controlled slack, right? This jig is falling. The way I'm getting the action on this jig is when it's falling. So if that's the way that it gets bit almost all the time, I want it falling almost all the time. So how do we do that? Well, one, controlled slack. I need light tension on the line, enough to pull the slack out but not so much that it's drifting sideways because if it's drifting sideways, I'm not getting the action that I'm looking for. If I'm not getting the action that I'm looking for, then what's the point of even fishing this technique, right? So controlled slack is the name of the game. Now you see these guys with the slow, slow pitch rods, right? Super parabolic and they don't have a lot of backbone, but the tip has a lot of action. And the tip is trying to give this thing the zipping pattern on, on the way up as they're reeling it in. So they're, they're reeling up, controlled slack, the jig falls, reeling up again, falls again, reeling up, falls again. So what they're doing is every time this thing reels up, the jig's falling, right? So you're trying to keep that falling pattern going with the jig and letting the jig work and do its thing. That's what it's meant to do, right? These are vertical jigging, okay? Now you can do the same thing with a conventional rod, okay? But I'm not winding up every time I, I, I lift the rod. So let's say a captain says the fish are at 300 feet. I drop down, say 300 feet, uh, pretty much the edge of where I typically want to fish anyway. I'm at 300 feet, I lock in, put it in gear. I'm gonna whip this rod up as high as I can. I'm gonna high stick it as high as I can, as fast as I can. And all of a sudden the jig's gonna come flying up, just like I went on, on a slow pitch technique. And then now it's gonna go slack and it's gonna start falling vertically the way that I want it again giving a jig action. What are we doing? We're creating jig action in the target zone the entire time, right? Quick whip, half second, takes three, four seconds for this thing to fall, right? So now I'm spending 80% of the time in the falling action, what I'm looking for in the area that I want to be fishing, right? So let's say that I've been doing this, whipping it up 10, 12 times in that zone, I'm not getting bit. I'll give it six, seven, eight more cranks on the, on the reel, and I'll come up, and I'll be doing the same thing, right? So whip it up, I'm letting the jig fall and I'm pointing my rod, my rod tip slowly down, making sure that there's slack in the line as it's falling, but not so slack that it's gonna get looped up on my guides. You notice a lot of the slow pitch rods, the guides actually turn around and go, come to the bottom of well, one, it's not gonna allow them to slack and catch on top. And then two, they have so much parabolic in them that and it's not really gonna have a chance to get loose and fall on the line anyway. Now, we talked about line size. This reel is fitted with 130 pound. I've seen a lot of guys say, oh, all you need is 100. I've broken fish off 100 before, seen fish broke off 100. To move to 130 pound line is not that much more space on, on your reel. Uh, so if you can fit it, make sure you step up to 130. I wanna stick with a solid line. A solid line has very thin surface area and we start dropping really deep. You can talk to the slow pitch guys that fish jigs sometimes that have seven to 800 feet. Uh, when they're fishing seven or 800 feet, they're using like 30, 40 pound line. It's because of the surface area on the line will actually grab in the current and start pulling the jig away. And when your jig starts going sideways and away and not straight up and down, you're losing the action of the jig. So they, they switch to a smaller, thinner line to go deeper, okay? Now, we're only fishing the top 300, 400 feet of the water column anyway, so you don't really need to go down in line size, but stick to that 130 pound line, maybe 100 pound, and uh, you should be pretty good to go. So as far as overall setups, uh, again, this is a pin Fathom 60 wide, uh, Phoenix Access HAX 780. Uh, this is a 2X heavy. It's rated to uh, 100 pounds. Um, I like a little bit extra parabolic on that tip, so I'm not worried about fishing 130 on this thing. This reel will get the job done on 95% of the fish that we have out here, you know, usually up to like 200, 250 pounds. This setup will get it done 
95% uh, of the time. There's always gonna be the one that gets away. You know, it's always, always gonna be out there. Um, Pin is making some updates to these reels. They'll be at iCast uh, next week, so you'll probably see them. But they are gonna come out with an 80 wide, so you have even more line capacity uh, than you already have now. Now, why use a rail rod versus a slow pitch rod? And how is slow pitch different than what we're doing? Um, so this is still your typical heavy, heavy rod, two speed lever drag setup. A lot of guys are using the same, same reels, but they're using them on, on slow pitch rods. Um, and there's a lot of slow pitch stuff out there. So to, this would be a whole nother video on slow pitch fishing. Uh, <laughs> we'll do it in the future. But most of the slow pitch stuff is really meant for that lighter line. And to fish that stuff, people use a lot lighter setups. So they're not really meant for a hundred pound line. Uh, the line classifications for slow pitch is a little bit different. They're called, they're PE rated. So like a PE eight to a PE 10 is like a hundred pound rated rod. Uh, most of the stuff you see out there is like a PE four or PE six. Um, that's really just meant for like reef fishing, right? So the reason why that works so well for bottom fishing is because you can drop a 500 pound jig all the way down, say six, 700 feet on a little noodle rod and on 40 pound line, right? And you're gonna hook, let's say a grouper that's down there, right? You're gonna fight that fish for a little bit, right? But he's all the way down there, right? Your rod is doing all the work. It's being parabolic the whole time and then you're grinding that thing up. Well, once you grind up about two, 300 feet, that fish dies. It's, it's, it's a rockfish, it's gonna die. It's, it's belly's gonna come out of his mouth, it's gonna be bloated. And then for the next 500 feet, you're basically reeling up a bucket of water the whole way. So there's not much fight in it. It's a lot different technique than you would be fighting on something like this. So um, there is some really cool setups out there. I, I do plan exploring some of them on those PE8, PE10 rods. Uh, doing slow pitch, but you'll find most of those rods are really short. So um, this rod is seven, eight. I, I really like like an eight foot rod is like my, my home run rod for everything. Far enough so when it's parabolic that the tip is away from the boat. Um, that's just my style of fishing. Some of these guys like those really short rods, but uh, I, I don't like to lose fish. So having a, a rod where it went, you know, let's say this is, the, this is the boat. It's bent over right here and I'm 10 feet up. You know, this fish is pinwheeling always to the surface. It's gonna give a chance for that line to rub on the boat and uh, I'm trying to avoid that. So this is what I'm sticking with for now. I, I will be experimenting this year with some more stuff, but um, that's pretty much it for our update when it comes to vertical jigging. If you have any more questions, make sure you drop them in the comments and uh, we'll try and answer them for you. Thanks guys, take care. Hey, thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and check out our website and online store at chasingprojects.com and make sure you share the stoke.